All right, it is uh, on the hour, so we'll go ahead and get started again. Uh, my name is Yi. I'm one of the residents at UCSF, uh, and welcome to our first session of the day. And uh, this morning, we're proud to present Dr. Joseph Pariser from the University of Minnesota, who will be talking to us about gender-affirming genital surgery. Well, thanks for having me. I picked this broad topic, um, which I could talk all day about, so I'll try to give you the highlights for what I think um, I would, would have wished I knew as a resident and things I want my residents to know. It's probably not the best talk for uh, in-service exam questions, but I, hopefully it's educational. I'm happy to take questions at the end, and I'll be moving quickly because it's a lot to get through. I have no disclosures. The goals of my talk today are to review best practices in working with transgender patients, review WPATH guidelines for gender-affirming surgery, then I'll move on to feminizing surgeries and talk about surgical options and approaches to vaginoplasty, and then outcomes and revisions and approaches for those. And then I'll move on to masculinizing genital surgery and discuss outcomes and revisions of phalloplasty. So I'll start with a poll. I just want to know kind of who I'm talking to. So what's your current experience in your department regarding involvement in gender-affirming surgery? And I encourage you to pick the lowest one on the list, meaning and um, I would also say if, for example, plastic surgeons are doing the cases um, and you don't ever go in there and you're a urology resident, then that doesn't count. But uh, if you could answer what you do at your institution, in your department. And again, pick the lowest one that applies to you. All right, so uh, it looks like there's a big variety. 20% of people are doing phalloplasty and vaginoplasty. Um, a lot of people are doing ORC or none at all. So that's fine. So a nice variety today. Okay, so let's start with basic terminology when you see patients. First of all, there's gender identity. That's one own self, own sense of gender, which develops uh, at a young age. And then there's sex assigned at birth. Gender incongruence is when gender identity and the sex assigned at birth don't match. And that causes gender dysphoria, which is the distress of that incongruence. And that's in the DSM-5, and that's the preferred nomenclature right now. And the diagnosis code, for example, when you do a case. Um, and all these terms, transgender means that they're not the same. Cisgender means you were born and your gender is the same thing. Um, and then these other terms, which you may hear if you see enough patients, gender queer, gender non-binary, gender fluid, are also used in generally acceptable, and patient, some patients uh, in my clinic use these terms for themselves. Now, old, outdated terms that I would recommend against, and you should shy against using in text or speech, is gender, gender identity disorder, do not call it a disorder, it's offensive to many people, or transsexual. Um, these terms have been abandoned by, uh, they're outdated and obsolete terms. There's a gender unicorn, um, and this just highlights that gender identity, gender expression, sex assigned at birth are all different axes. And then physically attracted and emotionally attracted to are different. And just because you're more masculine doesn't make you less feminine necessarily. And there are other genders. I encourage you all to, after this talk, do your own gender unicorn. But just keep in mind that these different axes work um, independently of each other. I'll review a little bit of uh, population data. So here's a survey in Minnesota uh, that surveyed 80,000 students in 9th and 11th grade. 2.7% of them, um, if you ask them kind of anonymously, will identify as transgender or gender nonconforming. And just notably, the self-reported health status of these students was poor when compared to their cisgender peers. There's a JAMA study, uh, which used the national inpatient sample, which showed that the incidence of gender-affirming surgery increased over time. Um, and that lots of people postulate it has to do with the Affordable Care Act, which banned discrimination based on gender identity. There's a market scan database, which is a commercial database of commercial insurance, and uh, looked at just all gender affirming surgery, both top and bottom surgery. The most common surgery is mastectomy. There's been a steady increase of surgery of all types throughout their study period of 2009 to 2015. And interestingly, I get this question all the time about the mean age of my patients. The mean age of patients undergoing gender-affirming surgeries in their 20s, but you do see this tail goes out all the way into the 70s, and we've done phalloplasty for 70-year-olds. General tips in seeing patients uh, who are trans or gender-nonconforming. 
I gen people always ask me like, what do I do about addressing them? Use the first name that they prefer when introducing them. Ask patients how they like to be addressed. Ask their pronouns when you meet them. I do it every intake of every trans patient. Simply state in your note, transgender male or transgender female. I see a lot of my residents say male to female transitioned trans. That's generally, people don't like to be assigned their old pronoun. Some people still use it, but I've moved to just doing transgender male, transgender female. And most of the community, at least in my area, tend to prefer that. I use the term gender affirmation. You still see gender confirmation. That's probably acceptable in most circles, but most people are using affirmation. But gender reassignment and sex reassignment or sex change is not uh, preferred nomenclature right now. Don't use the wrong pronoun or the old gender. Don't just assume it's Mr., Mrs., Ms. Um, certainly some people prefer uh, gender non-binary or some people find these terms as, as, uh, very assuming. Don't assume anything about their sexual orientation, um, whether they prefer men or women, partner acceptance or marital status. Sometimes the people transition into marriage and they're totally fine and sometimes things change, but assuming that is uh, not ideal. Do not use statements like used to be a girl or used to be a she. Don't show off transgender patients. I find you'd be surprised how many patients of mine will say, oh, I, I really worry about coming to a lot of clinics or especially the ER because I went there for pneumonia, let's say, or an asthma attack and they kept doing genital exams on me and new people kept coming in and you'd be amazed how many of stories like that I've heard. And don't use judgment or negative language um, in clinic or your notes when there are two people's faces. People get that a lot. Here's a list of uh, all the options for surgery. We broadly categorize these into feminizing and masculinizing surgery. Feminizing surgery can be top surgery, masculinizing as well. Lower surgery is over here, lower or bottom, either one, depends. Facial surgery, which I won't get into today. Facial feminization surgery is a field which um, has some, probably out of all this whole list, the hardest time getting um, insurance coverage. There isn't really facial masculinizing surgery. So I'll review the WPATH care, WPATH standards of care guidelines. Uh, insurance companies go by this and most, and generally you should be following these if you're gonna offer surgery for patients. Top surgery is one letter of support, no social transition required, and no hormone therapy required, though it is recommended to have estrogen therapy at least one year prior to breast augmentation because people can get a lot of breast growth and they may not, they may decide that's enough. And everyone's a little bit different. Lower surgery or bottom surgery requires two letters of support, 12 months of a social transition for the bigger surgeries. Um, for hysterectomy and ORC, you don't necessarily need a social transition, though I feel like in general, most of my patients have had that. And then you need 12 months of hormone therapy prior to any of these surgeries too, unless you have a clear medical contraindication. For example, you can't be on estrogen because you've had a history of blood clots, for example. You can make an exception if you document that and they hit all the other criteria, but the vast, 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 vast majority have hit all criteria. So I'll review orchiectomy really quick. Um, what you want to do is you, you see the patient, you get a history, you ensure WPATH criteria for genital surgery, I obtain a prior auth with insurance. Once that comes back, a few weeks later, I schedule them for an outpatient procedure. You should do a midline scrotal incision, not subinguinal. I don't like to burn any bridges. If you know Some patients know they want a vaginoplasty in the future. Some patients have no idea. Um, subinguinal incision is going to be in your future vaginoplasty, lead to more scarrings and an incision in your flap. It's easier to do subinguinal, but you should do a scrotal incision. Um, I like it the cord times two with the external inguinal ring. I use O-Silk suture. The pivot came with Epi for cord blocks and incisional blocks. Some patients do ask about scrotal resection. I try to avoid that because it, the scrotum is what you're going to use later for vaginoplasty, but sometimes I take a little off if they're insistent. Um, the scrotum does deflate after, and it gets pretty flat, so patients... I haven't really had a patient complain that uh, I really wanted the scrotum removed and you didn't really remove much and now it's too boggy. Anecdotally, I send the testicles together. There's no reports of incidental malignancy during any orchiectomy ever. I mean, the only reason to send them separate is for templates later in their abdomen, but um, I guess you can, but I send them together. Ligate them high at the ring. You do have patients who get these done by people who don't do them very often. 
And, you know, it's sort of the opposite of doing it for prostate cancer where you want to leave the stump. You want to not leave the stump. Patients are like, some patients have very small testicles to begin with, leave the stump and you get a little hematoma there. And they're like, well, you didn't even do the orc if you have these stumps and patients find it dysphoric. I've had to go resect stumps during vaginoplasties because they got orc somewhere else. And so ligate it high. I mean, don't go so high you lose the, the you lose it, but go as high as you can safely. And then timing of orchiectomy, do you do it during another procedure or like a vaginoplasty or breast augmentation? I can go into the benefits and there's, not, there's small benefits and small negatives of each. I let the patients decide. Um, some patients feel strongly one way or the other. That's it for org. I'll move on to vaginoplasty now. So there's a bunch of discussions to have with patients before surgery. And one is, or do you want a full depth vaginoplasty or do you want a limited depth vaginoplasty? Limited depth also means vulvoplasty, zero depth, minimal depth, whatever. It just means you can't have receptive penetrative intercourse um, afterwards. Everything on the outside will look the same. I tell the patients, well, are you planning to have something put in there? Some of this depends on their partner. Some of them depends on their uh, risk for morbidity of surgery and how, um, and how willing they're going to risk a rectal injury. So this is ultimately patient decision, but it's also appropriate counseling to inform patients that it's an option. At uh, OHSU, they, um, they looked at their, their cohort of vaginoplasty patients, and they found that 8% of patients chose to have a vulvoplasty only, and 93% of them were satisfied. In fact, many of them chose it without a clear reason, they, uh, a medical reason. They just wanted it for a variety of reasons, like not having to dilate, lower morbidity, no plans for receptive intercourse, and satisfaction rates are very high. The other thing to think about is how you're going to line the canal. The standard is penile inversion with scrotal skin graft for the apex, but there also is peritoneal vaginoplasty, which can be done for primary or revision surgery, and intestinal vaginoplasty, like a sigmoid or ileal vaginoplasty. There's also a decision, and this tends to be surgeon preference, whether you do early excision or late excision of the skin. Early excision is seen over here on the left. You basically start the surgery by cutting this piece of skin out. And then, uh, and the nice part about that is you can uh, skin, you can thin that out and get the skin graft um, throughout the rest of the procedure where late excision is seen over here on the right. And they basically pull it down. This is right after they excise these two triangles of skin. This is more flexible, but if you, if you have multiple teams working at the same time, the resident at the back table, for example, early excision is a little quicker. Here's an example of a vaginoplasty we did at U of M a few months ago. Um, here's how it started, and here's how it ended. Here's another example. And here's another example. Okay, so how do you get there? Um, I'll go through the basic steps of vaginoplasty, especially for those who haven't seen them before. You start with penile disassembly. The order is a little bit different for different people. So if you watch different people, this is how I approach it. Uh, you start with penile disassembly. You start and you separate a penis into its parts. That's the skin tube, the glands and neurovascular bundle, the corporal bodies, and the urethra. And here's a nice picture from Dr. George Vick. Uh, here's the skin tube. This neurovascular bundle is a little bit thinned out. Usually this is, usually I do this um, a little different than that, but then, and then, or, and then this is the u urethra and those are separated. You're gonna keep the skin tube because that's gonna line the canal. The glands and neurovascular bundles, the glands are gonna be thinned and made smaller to make a clitoris. The corporal bodies uh, are excised and the urethra is cut short and spatulated. Once those are separated and you got rid of some, and they're all in their parts, you do a clitoroplasty. Now, there's different shapes for this clitoroplasty. We prefer a W. Some people prefer more of a, a, a moon shape. But either way, you're going to take the part with the urethra and probably discard it. And the top and sides get removed. You keep this propitial collar. That's going to turn your labia minora and clitoral hood. And then this is going to be the, the future neo, uh, neoclitoris. Here's our markings from that case I showed you earlier that we're gonna cut and keep the top. 
you can dissect this right on the neurovascular bundles, or you can be below the top edge of the tunica albuginea of the corpus cavernosa. I prefer to do it that way. It's faster and safer for the neurovascular bundles. You roll it into a little bean-shaped clitoris. The neurovascular bundles are coordinated. And the clitoris, there's always a, well, who, where does this thing go? Roughly at the level of the adductor longus tendons, which are marked here. Step two is urethroplasty. You're gonna dissect the urethra back. I usually start somewhere in the pendulous urethra. I joke with the residents that um, if, you're, if you wanna get good at Kulkarni dorsal onla urethroplasties, practice on the vaginoplasty um, in the penile urethra. If you bang the urethra, you're gonna, you're gonna discard it anyway at that level. And you can see how fast you can dissect a completely healthy urethra off the corpus cavernosa. So anyway, I usually do this while the plastic surgeon is doing the clitoroplasty, and I try to finish at the same time. We dissect the urethra anywhere along the pendulous urethra and circle. You dissect this back to the bulbar urethra. You spatulate ventrally. Here's a ventral spatulation. The tip of the urethra, meaning the tip of the spatulation right here, is going to meet the neoclitoris later. And then you're going to cut this back until you get right to the turn. So you can aim because that's gonna aim the urethra into the toilet when people sit to pee. And then you over sew these edges, because these are this is healthy corpus spongiosum, you're gonna over sew these edges to prevent bleeding in the future. Then I do canal dissection. You can definitely do canal dissection earlier in the case, and some people do that, especially if you're doing early excision, but this is generally when we do the canal dissection. You can, how to handle the bulbous spongiosus muscle, varies. Some people choose to excise it early. We've done it both ways. I find it easier to actually leave it in place. Um, it keeps me away from the urethra. We use a rectal condom drape and using my left index fingers in the rectum, feeling that rectal wall while I dissect. Um, dissection continues along to non fascia. We use sharp dissection. I've learned a it used to always go in the middle, but now I've started maximizing laterally first and working towards the midline. And that really helps you realize what's the tissue that's got to go and where am I headed to. I constantly appreciate both the Foley and my finger. And you learn with time how much, how obvious that Foley should feel. A completely obvious Foley means you're right in the prostatic, you're right in the prostate meat itself and you're gonna hit the urethra and you're gonna see the catheter sometime if you keep in that plane. Um, but you should definitely realize where the urethra is and then your finger, the same thing. If you feel your finger in the rectum and you're cutting right on it, you're getting really close. I've learned with time, you need a good assistant. So we do this as two attending surgeons usually. Um, I go to the peritoneal reflection, which now once you pass the tough part and you get on the prosthetic capsule, it's easy, smooth sailing, and it's nice, easy, blunt dissection. But that's the toughest part, getting right past that prostatic apex into the right layer. Some people use a Lowsley or bipolar scissors or blunt dissection. I've tried most of these. Um, I don't find them that helpful. Blunt's useful at the end. The peritoneal reflection, just FYI, is right around where you cut if you started a posterior dissection for a route. So that's where you should be. And if you poke through that layer, you're going to see intestines. So that's how far you want to be. Now, you can't always do that. but um, you don't want to be doing these surgeries if you're going to chicken out every single time and make very short canals. You should feel comfortable making full canals almost always. I mean, be safe, but all of our canals can, just about all of our canals can accommodate a purple or orange sole source dilator by the end. That's the goal. Next, after the skin is removed, you're going to want to, and the canals made, you're going to want to, if you haven't, if you, if you did late excision, you're going to excise the labia. If it's early excision in the back table, they would have been making this skin tube. This is going to be your new vaginal lining, absorbable sutures, and you're going to form this over some mold or one of the dilators. Once that's done, and you got to thin this really thin. Once that's done, you connect it to the hole where the penile skin ended. And so basically, it's, it's like a completely prolapsed vagina here and that's going to be inside out um, uh, when you flip it inside out. Next you're going to do your labiaplasty which is excising these and forming these. You also have a perineal flap here which gets inset. 
And once you sew this all in, you're going to sew the labia minor to the side here, the side here, get the prepucial skin attached to the labial flap, and then sew the sides. Of note, the point of max wound dehiscence, which happens frequently, is right here. Because that's the tip of the flap where the blood supply is the worst, and it's the point of maximal um, tension on the incisions. So wound, minor wound dehiscence are common. Postoperative care uh, includes, a, some people use a packing or stent or a wound vac. We've done both. I don't clearly think one's better than the other. We leave it for five days. We tend to do these cases on Thursdays. Patients stay in the hospital with drains, Foley. This is a stent um, until about Tuesday. So five days, Take everything as long as everything goes well, we take everything out um, on day five. And then they go home, we do a manual exam a gentle dilation, and then we bring them back to clinic a few days later and start dilating. Complications of vaginoplasty include uh, blood clots, which are thought to be related to estrogen therapy and extended, you know, especially for prolonged cases early in your learning curve, lithotomy position. But prior retrospective studies have demonstrated this tends to be a pretty low risk. Um, zero patients in the San Francisco group um, had VTEs. In a UK study, 1.3% had it. Practices vary um, in how people manage this. Some people say just lower it to two milligrams and that's fine. Some people stop it. Some people give heparin. Some people don't. Um, people don't like to stop their estrogen because that's part of the gender dysphoria treatment. So it's generally thought to be more patient-centered to leave them on estrogen, but you got to do it safe. But no one really knows. In our practice, we hold estrogen for three or four weeks prior. We give a single dose of heparin sub-Q pre-op. Um, other complications related to making the canal. You can injure the urethra or rectum, obviously. The largest series is from Amsterdam with 475 patients. They reported a rectal injury rate of 2.3% and a rectal vaginal fistula rate of 0.6%. So this rate is all comers, especially people they saw a hole in the operating room and they fixed it. These are people who ended up after the surgery, having stool coming out of the vagina, either a small amount or a lot. Other series report 0.4 to 4.5% rate of rectal injury. So it's varied, but it's low risk, but real. Um, urethra injuries less frequently or standard, standardly reported, but the rate is also a couple percent. And some patients can have a fistula if it's really high and they could leak from incontinence. But if your, urethra if your urethra injury is in like the membranous urethra after the sphincter, they're not going to have incontinence. They'll just have some vaginal voiding and they may not even know. So usually not something you fix. You might put a few stitches in, but you're not going to go fix it later. Um, next is wound complications. Minor wound issues are present in about a quarter of patients, but studies vary. And then meatal stenosis can happen. It depends on the study. Sometimes it's super rare in some studies. In some studies, it goes up to 30, 40%. What you, if you read into the weeds of these studies that are higher percentage, they do an end urethrostomy, not the big spatulated opening, which I talked about earlier. Um, so anyway, I, we all recommend now doing a spatulated urethral meatus with a nice dorsal plate of the dorsal urethra. If they do have this stenosis, it's pretty easy to fix. Um, it's usually a cutback meatoplasty or some sort of YV plasty. I think you're going to get a uh, talk in a week or two um, from Dr. Rayblad about feminizing, about vaginoplasty complication management. But anyway, that's a pretty easy one to fix, and I do see it pretty frequently. Vaginal stenosis is reported in 2 to 12% of patients. This definitely could be underreported. Some patients are way out, stop dilating, and then this happens. Some patients get this early on. Often it's related to the cessation of dilation. Some patients just never had a great canal to start. And some patients get some sort of hematoma or, or uh, infection that causes some vaginal stenosis. There's been a systematic review of uh, vaginoplasty complications and outcomes. And here's the brief list of studies that they included in this systematic review. What you'll find is most studies are retrospective. The vaginal anatomy is not assessed in many studies. Complication rates vary widely, and maybe that's technique. Maybe some centers do it better, but this also could definitely and probably be captured. Sexual function, which is 
this column is not is only reporting about half of studies. Patient satisfaction, which is this outcome, is only reporting about half of studies. Quality of life assessment is very rarely assessed and follow up very significantly anywhere from six months to years. Revision labiaplasty, we always talk about with patients before we even sign them up for the primary. I tell patients, some patients don't heal well or desire a more, we call it lenticular shaped labia or vulva. And some patients with the healing get granulation or scarring, but these revision labiaplasties have a high uh, satisfaction rate. Here's an example of one of our patients. She didn't heal well, she got a wound infection. There was some dehiscence inferiorly, but she's all healed up. This is a few months after surgery. We took her to the OR. We did a Z-plasty up here and an introitus repair. And here's her immediate post-operative outcome even just a few weeks later. You can see the vicrals that are still, so, uh, still uh, haven't fallen out. And so it's a nice, it's a nice procedure and um, this tends to fall on the plastic surgeons, but it's a nice procedure to get good at learning how and when and what options you have for labiaplasty. Robotic peritoneal vaginoplasty warrants a slide. Um, the NYU group has really pioneered this. Um, it, they, they do it for primary vaginoplasties now um, and revisions. I do them for revisions. Um, I haven't done a primary, but uh, it wouldn't be any, I know I can, but I haven't seen a patient where I, I know I need it, perhaps in the future. In their series, there's a low complication rate. You're using hairless peritoneal skin. Um, here's a diagram from their paper that here's the uh, recto, recto vesicle pouch, basically where you start a posterior section of a prostate. You incise this, advance the peritoneal flap to meet whatever you're going to. If there's a revision, they usually have a short canal. This edge goes to this edge, this edge goes to this edge. This one, they're doing a primary, doing some skin graft in the middle, and then you free the top and sew them together. They end up being U-shaped flaps both up and down. And here's how it ends. You see this rectum going sigmoid and rectum going down here's the anterior flap the lateral wings it's closed up and there's some packing patients at least in my experience do great and in their paper they're a nice series they do great and uh especially for patients who think i'm gonna have a one or two inch canal forever um either due to a complication or getting a surgery where they didn't get a good canal canal to start it's really life-changing for them these are anecdotal pitfalls of vaginoplasty and reasons for revisions. Orchiectomy stumps, which I talked about. Clitoricize, a little bit of Goldilocks phenomenon. If it's too big, it looks like a little phallus. If it's too small, it's hard to find. Remnant erectile bodies. You'd be surprised how many patients have remnant erectile bodies and notice fullness. And uh, during revision, I go back and carve out their remnant erectile bodies on their pubis. Canal dissection, be safe, but patients don't like short, narrow canals. Urethral transection, if it's too distal, it aims over the toilet seat, the urethra is right under their clitoris and they tilt their pelvis to pee. But if it's too proximal, you get a really painful end of the case. And some patients will complain about spraying or vaginal voiding. If you wanna see how proximal you can go with the urethral uh, transection, here's a patient with LS, who's a transgender female who wanted a vaginoplasty. You can see she's had a couple first stage Johansson's and was living with a SP tube, and she, we uh, took her for vaginoplasty. Here's her pre-op VCUG, goes all the way back to the membranous urethra. And here's her vaginoplasty, and she's peeing catheter free. We left the catheter for a little bit longer, but she's fine, two in one. That's it for vaginoplasty. I'll move on to masculinizing gender affirming surgery. The goals for this is aesthetic masculine appearance, voting while standing, erogenous sensation, and erectile function. Phalloplasty techniques involve one stage or multiple stage procedures, and I don't count prostheses in these stages. Most are single flap tube within a tube, but you can do composite flaps. Free flap options include radial forearm, which is most common, lat flap, free fibular, or pedicled flaps. ALT is most common, but you can do skip flaps or abdominal flaps. Here's examples of a one stage radial forearm that we did, um, and you can see we did all the steps in one. Here's an ALT, now this patient, we didn't do this one, but there's a lot of, th this patient had a thicker thigh and most ALTs end up being much thicker and a little less physiologic than radial forearms. You can debulk it later, of course. Here's an option for if your ALT flap is too thick, 
but you want to use an ALT for a variety of reasons, you can use a composite flap. This is a skip flap and an ALT flap. So the inside urethra is a groin flap and an ALT is the outside. And you end up some sort of a middle ground between the two without an arm scar. Another option for genital surgery for trans man is a metoidioplasty. Here's a nice paper. Um, you basically free up the clitoris, <clears throat> cut the suspensory ligaments. Uh, there's a bunch of ways to handle the urethra, but you do a urethral lengthening procedure to uh, get the urethra to the tip of the clitoris. You free it all up, you get some skin coverage, and you uh, build a scrotum and do a vaginectomy. Patients get almost all of those outcomes. They might not be happy with their appearance. They might be. And uh, most of these patients can't have penetrative intercourse, um, but they can pee while standing and uh, help their dysphoria. Here's the anatomic parts of the urethra. So here's the bladder. Here's the native female urethra. You have to build this pars fixa or horizontal or fixed urethra um, out of labia minora. I'll talk about it in a minute. And then there's anastomosis here between the phallic urethra and the pars fixa. This is the most common point of problem in stricture in these patients. And, um, and, uh, and then the meatus. Here are the steps of phalloplasty. I'll start with flap harvest and transfer. So here's a flap harvest um, of a radial forearm um, from a nice paper. Here's the template, the shaft. This, so this is the outside of the tube. This is de-epithelialized. And then this is the inner part of the tube. Notice the urethra extends farther because you've got to connect back to that labia, labial urethra. And then you get nerve, artery, and vein over here. You double tube it. And then uh, you do a, a transfer. Here's one of our patients we did, nice, uh, nice dissection. Here's another one of our patients we did. Here's an ALT. Um, this is a tube and tube ALT, which we don't do a ton of in our center. Um, but basically you see the thigh. This is a one stage, which uh, they already finished the scrotoplasty. This is the inner tube, and this is the outer tube, and they're sewn it up over a catheter. This is pedicled, ALTs are pedicled generally. And then this is an example of one of our skip flaps. We're doing a staged uh, procedure. This is the uh, skip harvest site, which is just gonna be primarily closed. And this is the urethra already connected down here. And then we're gonna do the ALT, tunnel it under here and wrap it around here. Kind of nice double pedicled flap without the downsides of ALT. The downside of doing this, you gotta harvest two flaps and the skip blood supply is a little tougher to get right. Now, do you stage it or not stage it? I've done them both ways, and I now stage it. A lot of the big centers do, and I'll tell you why. The advantage of a single stage is there's fewer surgeries, and it sounds great. Come in once, you'll heal up, you'll be peeing out of your urethra in a couple weeks. So the advantage is fewer surgeries. But it's a long day in the operating room. You need multiple teams working at the same time, and all the complications get piled together. And I'll show you later the complication rates are very high, and some of the complications can cause other complications. There's two ways to stage it. You can do metoidioplasty first, which most people don't do now. That's where you do the, basically do a metoidioplasty. And then on the second stage, you add the flap on top. The advantages are you get the whole proximal urethra done and that's all healed and you get the vaginal, vaginectomy done. And some patients even stop after the metoidioplasty if they don't want to go through the flap. But really what you're trying to do is separate the flap complications from the urethral complications because some of the flap complications cause the urethral complications. So what most of uh, these centers do now is we do the flap transfer first. Once that's healed, then months later, in our hands, five months, six months later, you do a vaginectomy, urethra, proximal urethroplasty, scrotoplasty. And if you want, you can do the glansplasty here or here, depending on the flap. The advantages are you're really separating those complications from each other. You can, and if you get a flap complication, you can still pee just fine because you're they're peeing out of a native ure urethra. And then the other advantage is if you try to do a one stage, it's really painful to do a robotic vaginectomy because you're going to be in everyone's way with the robot because you're trying to harvest an arm at the same time. I prefer a robotic vaginectomy, which is easy to do during the second stage because it's basically an entirely perineal surgery. So you just do a robotic vaginectomy to the perineal and you still end in a reasonable time. I'm going to uh, go through these steps pretty quickly. So you need to find the clitoral nerve during the first, if you're going to stage it during the first stage. Here's a completed clitoral nerve dissection. They're just like on a penis, uh, dorsal, a little bit lateral, and you de-epithelialize the clitoris, um, but that's the nerve. This is going to be cut and anastomosed to the flap. 
of erogenous sensation. You, um, next, I'll talk about clitoral burying. We like to bury the clitoris on the first stage. So this has been deepathized, like in that other picture, buried anastomose, and this is how the end of the first stage looks for our patients. This is from Oregon. Um, they don't, and NYU doesn't bury the clitoris first. Um, they but the flap is done, and they're going to bury the clitoris on the second stage. It really doesn't matter. The urethra goes a little bit laterally here from midline, but it's not a big deal. You don't actually have to bury the clitoris at all. Some patients prefer to have it out for sensation reasons. Next, I'll talk about vaginectomy. You can do this perineally, which is the classic way to do it. Um, and if you're doing single stage, uh, I think most people do it perineally because you can work simultaneously as the flap surgeon. Um, you can do excision, which is sort of the classic way to do it, or you can vaporize, which you just fry it. You can do a combo where you excise it first and then vaporize the apex. It's really hard to do a complete vaginal resection in a patient with no prolapse, um, especially if the hysterectomy was done super high. Um, there's been a recent excision series from Oregon demonstrating a really low complication rate, and there is a learning curve to this. Um, vaporization can lead to hydrodissection, especially if you get a proximal fistula, it can leak into that, and I'll show you a picture later, and that could require revision surgery. I prefer, I've done it both ways. I prefer robotic. It just makes for a nicer surgery, a little cleaner surgery. Um, and I do that in a stage approach and it just allows for a more complete excision. Next, I'll talk about urethroplasty for the pars fixa. Um, basically, here's the catheter in the native urethra. This is the labia minora on stretch. You cut down the apex of this and you roll this inner to get it to the tip. So you, we're freeing this up and it rolls to the tip. This is sort of a nearly completed picture of just that first layer. And then you put the bubble spongiosis over it and you, you close this in layers to try to prevent a fistula. That's the area most common to get a fistula. If you're doing a two stage, this is how the second stage looks. You basically cut the sides here. If you didn't bury the clitoris, you gotta bury it now. And then you do the bubble spongiosis and you close it up. Here's an example of one of our patients after their second stage uh, urethroplasty, second stage phalloplasty, and he's peeing tube free and happy. Um, before we finish that all up, you do the scrotoplasty, which is basically doing um, a VY plasty. So you're going to, this is all going to be reconstructed. These are the flaps that are going to become this labia. Here are the flaps here that are going to be rolled up, and those are rolled up, and the perineum is closed. There's a balance here because if you make this too, people like it wide here because the scrotum's bigger, but if you make it too wide, then you get tension here and a wound dehiscence. If you make this too small, you get a tiny scrotum. So there's a balance, Goldilocks. Next, you do glansplasty. You can do this during an AL, you can do this during a radial forearm at the same time. You can do it a few weeks later. You can do this during the second stage. If you're doing ALT, you almost always do it later for blood supply reasons. You don't want to lose the tip of your penis because you decided to do the glansplasty too soon. The classic technique was a Munawar technique, which is the rolled skin flag. These days, most people use a Norfolk technique, which is you cut here, you roll this tube, and then you fill this in with a split thickness graft. There's a modification of this called a Belgium glansplasty, where you do the same thing, except this edge and this edge, meaning the vertical edge and the horizontal edge, are covered with skin graft. This is what we do. I think you get a better outcome. You can do them as two separate graphs. So you're doing a suture line, suture line, suture line. We do it and suture line, or we do it, we do one graft and actually have an L shape in it. I'll show you some pictures. So here's from the Belgium paper. They cut there, they pick, they harvest, they raise it a little bit, and then they pinch it up, and they do two separate flaps here. This is one of our patients. And then we cut here, rolled it, and this is a L shaped. You got to you got to you got to dress this really nice to get some get some nice uh, pressure. Here's another one of our patients, and this bottom patient seven months later. This is how it looks. Phalloplasty complications include blood clots, wound dehiscences, hematomas, flap loss. Flap loss in most series is pretty low, five percent or less. Some techniques are higher, especially when you're doing composite flaps or uh, you know urethra is made out of free flaps that are experiencing compression. Some patients do need urgent take back. It doesn't count as flap loss in a lot of papers. Um, so keep in mind, you might take a patient back for a flap loss issue and then a flap uh, issue, and then they got to be put on blood thinners. Then you've got a vaginectomy, bleeding, then you get a scrotal hematoma, et cetera, et cetera. 
which is why I say complications beget complications in neophallus, which is why I like to stage them now. If you're the urologist and the plastic surgeon is taking a patient back for a flap issue, you're sitting there after the first stage, not really worried because you didn't do any proximal urethral reconstruction, you didn't do a vaginectomy. So the second case is just a urologic surgery. And you don't have to deal with any flap issues. Um, urethral complications are real. I'll go over some common looks. This is the most common uh, stricture in a post neophiles patient. And you can see after the pars fixa, there's an anastomotic stricture right there. Here's a, the pars fixa and here's a fistula, which ends up correlating to around the penis scrotal junction. Some of these heal, some of them don't. Some of them heal in, uh, some of them heal in a stricture. So you gotta watch and wait. Here's a more complex situation. So here's his uh, media. I didn't do this case, but I, I've been seeing him. This is a proximal uh, fistula here, where, right at the start of the pars fixa. Okay, you can see this filling up. He's got this fistula. This is starting to make its way down to the good part of urethra. Then you got a fistula distally too at the penis scrotal junction. And then here's how it looked when it all healed. He actually strictured this completely off and blew this all out. And so this is in his scrotum and even partly way down his phallus. And this is all the way back into his vaginal remnant. Not good. So uh, Dr. Zhao and the NYU group wrote up their series doing this. Um, uh, fistula repair with robotic excision of this vaginal remnant. Um, for this patient, it's a little more complex. He's got, he's got three problems. I haven't operated on him, but the plan is to do uh, fistula repair and vaginal remnant excision and a first stage urethroplasty for the distal. That way the distal, it stays open. He can heal this with low pressure. And then later, if everything heals great, then he gets a second stage distal urethroplasty of the penis scrotal junction. There's been a systematic review for outcomes regarding enphaloplasty. Um, basically, there's lots of not, no reported for all these different outcomes, which is um, just lack of standardization. Urethral complication rate, rate varies between 20 and 80%. Complications per patient, is 40 to 127% in these series. And donor site complications, which is kind of interesting, is 0.7 to 45%. So it just depends on what you're calling a complication. There's a few highlights. In, there's not much good fallow research out there, but there've been a couple things we've learned from big series. One is when you leave the vagina, there's a higher urethral complication rate because you can't put as many layers of bulbous spongiosis and all sorts of walls of the vagina over your suture line. So the urethral complication rate does go up in multiple series, more double or more than double. And then the other thing is if you're doing tube and tube at this center, at least, um, the urethral complication rate for ALT was higher than RFF, but that's a single center tube and tube. Like I talked about, you can, if the tube is too big and you're gonna get a giant thick ALT, you can use two flaps, which we talked about, and there's a nice paper on that. That's our practice in our group. And uh, generally they get pretty good outcomes. How do we fix these urethral complications? You know, do an EPA, do you do a buckle, do you do a skin graft? No one really knows. There's a series of 118 urethroplasties from a single center. This is kind of an older series now. Um, and they do all sorts of different repairs for all sorts of different parts of the urethra. And sadly, or maybe it's good, maybe it's bad. They're all moderately okay, moderately bad. So. There's a lot of different options and no one, no one has a standard way to treat these, but they're all 46%, a lot different success rates for urethros, urethral strictures in a neophiles compared to what we're used to in a regular bulbar urethral stricture, 80, 90%. Anecdotal pitfalls of urethroplasty or phalloplasty compared to like I talked about with vaginoplasty. There are some patients that have had numerous urethral surgery and become urethral cripples. These patients can self-dilate, they can switch to a perineal urethrostomy, but you always need to counsel a patient. Is it worth having another surgery? Are you worth, is it worth going through a stage surgery? What are your expectations? How much does it mean to you to stand to pee? And so just identifying those patients and counseling them right. I mean, there's no right answer to when you should stop. Uh, patients don't like a really small scrotum. Patients don't like an enormously wide phallus that they can't, if, especially if they're trying to insert that in a vagina. It could be too wide, like that ALT I showed you earlier. Patients don't like hairy urethra, so really try to get them to do skin or uh, hair removal and use hairless parts of skin if possible. And then I, I didn't have enough time to go into prosthesis, but patients complain about prosthesis all the time. These, these prostheses are not made for trans patients. We're just MacGyvering them to work. 
Uh, so testicular prosthesis, the most common complaint is they move too much. They're too hard. I sit on them. I'm not used to this. You didn't, you know, they're, I don't know why they move around so much. Um, and then penile prosthesis, they distally erode. They don't fill my penis right. I don't like having one cylinder. The size compared to the whole penis is not big enough. Proximal fixation, and then infection rates are much higher. So the take-home points from my talk is that the care of transgender patients is multidisciplinary. High complications uh, rates are prevalent, are present in all of these surgeries, especially phalloplasty, especially if you're doing a single stage. Um, now, two-stage doesn't actually give you less complications. No one has ever shown that, but at least they're separated and you can deal with one at a time. There's constant, unique surgical, cha surgical challenges for trans patients. Um, I feel that they're best served in a comprehensive center with an arsenal of plastics and urologic options for surgery. Um, for example, maybe a patient's best served with a robotic peritoneal vaginoplasty, but you're not going to offer it because you don't have a urologist. Or maybe they need a, 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 a urethroplasty that involves a, a bringing a new flap in, but you're a urologist and you're plastic, you don't have a plastic surgeon to give you a skip flap. So it's nice to work in a comprehensive center where you're giving the patient the best chance possible. I also get a lot of calls about how to set up a trans center, or I get a lot of even random people out there be like, well, I don't want to do fallows. I don't want to do vaginoplasties, but I just want to do a little something. How can I just get my beak wet or foot in the door in trans surgery? And I would say, um, you know, you could do orcs or something like that, but like dabbling in gender affirmation bottom surgery or even any of this is a risk to really be out on a limb because you're not going to be able to handle complications. You're not going to be used to really knowing what means something, a patient-centered outcome for these trans patients, and knowing what really matters to them if you don't really do it at, um, as a significant portion of your practice. So I recommend don't dabble in trans surgery. It's not just doing a surgery you do for another indication um, with the same metrics. Um, and the last thing I say is trans surgery is really rewarding, but... Um, the vast majority of your outcomes are easily visible by the patient. So you really need to make sure, this slide's sort of a joke, but you, you got to really make sure that you're, you're kind of a perfectionist in these surgeries because to try to get complication rates low and to get a good aesthetic outcome too. Here's our center at the U of M uh, CGC. And here's my references. Thanks. Great talk, Dr. Pariser. Uh, I think it's very comprehensive. We have a lot of great questions from the audience. And just a reminder, if we don't get to all of them, we'll be posting the Q&A um, on the website afterwards. And then please also fill out our evaluation uh, so that we can continue to improve our series. Um, some questions, let's start with some sort of post-op management questions. So how do you manage complications from patients who travel long distances for their surgery and go back home? And can they go to an outside ED with issues? And how, how do you sort of uh, mitigate that? Uh, I mean, we really personalize it. I try not to put people out on a limb, meaning um, I try to, if I'm not sure and the patient has a urethral complication after fallow, I tend to err on the side of leaving a suprapubic, for example, until everything's great. You know, local VCUGs probably is okay. Um, ERs outside really don't like uh, and really feel uncomfortable managing complications. I try to be available and give clear guidance. Um, vaginoplasties don't tend to have as many complications, especially not urgent ones. Urethroplast or uh, fallow is a little bit different and um, certainly like a retention issue and a fallow is a big issue, but you know, you can always put a super pubic tube in. Um, but yeah, I, I try to encourage them to come here, but if they're from a distance, it, it does make a challenge. I think staging it while driving twice or flying twice to our center is annoying. I actually think staging is better for this because, you know, when you do a one stage and they get on their plane or whatever back, there's the list is comprehensive and it's very high risk to get a complication that's going to be very complicated. Whereas... Um, it's a little bit different if you stage it. Like I said, the flap complications early. I mean, we keep them in the hospital for a while, so that's usually mitigated by the time they go home. And then um, the urethral complications uh, are the later ones. So, and that's separate than the flap. So I'm not worried about everything at the same time. Great. 
Uh, and then along those lines, uh, for patients who've had a, a neovagina or neophallus and then need a cystoscopy for hematuria or whatever reason, uh, do they need to come to a transgender specialist or, or, or not? And then also, similarly, post-vaginoplasty patients who need, may need prostatectomy, how do you counsel and sort of anticipate these issues for those patients? Um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't happen that often. I think a cysto for a, a post-vaginoplasty patient who doesn't have a stricture, who just needs a hematuria workup or has a kidney stone or something, I think that's fine. Anyone can do it. Um, I have had a number of vaginoplasty patients who go to urologists who aren't used to seeing vaginoplasty complications for various voiding complaints, like I don't pee well, or I have a weak stream, or I don't empty well, or it burns, or, or I'm not sh whatever, spraying. And it's amazing to uh, read the notes that come from them. And, you know, I, I don't, it's hard for me to pass judgment, but in some ways it's like, uh, some people, you know, whatever you find is not going to be that helpful, if that makes sense, unless it's an easily fixable problem. So those patients, I really do redo their urethroscopy and cystoscopy, and it really does help. But um, in fallow patients, if there's no stricture, they can they can have a cysto, but um, for other reasons. But um, like I said, dabbling in um, postoperative management, just because you you whatever is, is not that helpful I find most times but if you if you need a surgery for another reason that's fine a prostatectomy post vaginoplasty would be a super challenge because the prostate's right on that anterior wall uh, I'm not actually aware it's ever happened or needed um, but that would be a big that would be an issue great um, some questions about a few questions about penile implants and prostheses do you have the specific one that you use, is, do, is there a flap and implant combination you find to be the easiest, most successful? Uh, yeah, so there's a bunch of different techniques. Um, I didn't have time to go into it. There's the, basically categories fall into, first of all, there's no standard device in the U.S. on the market for neophallus penile implant. There is one in the U, in the Europe, but it um, has mixed results, and it's not in the U.S. called the Zephyr. Now, in the U.S., you can either use the standard one from one of the two companies, and um, and you can, in the two, the big camps involve wrapping the whole thing with a mesh or not, and then uh, where are you going to fixate it to? Are you going to fix it to the pubic symphysis, either in or just under the pubic symphysis, or are you going to fix it to the inferior pubic rami and make bilateral kind of groin incisions? And those are two camps, and you'll see big series out of there. I personally feel like wrapping the whole thing in mesh is risky, and I personally find it to be less invasive and a little more reliable to go in the pubic symphysis. Um, some people drill into the bone. Um, I don't find that generally necessary, and that's more morbid. So I tend to use the device that holds a proximal stitch better. Uh, this isn't like in a paper, but like just anecdotally, um, holds a, has a bigger rear uh, block of silicone that's tougher and will hold a stitch better, and they go under the pubic symphysis and tack it there. So I use the cold blast device, and I and I um, I tack it there, and I use a single cylinder, and I tall it out. There's a lot of nuances about penile prosthesis, and if you just never seen one, never talked to anyone, and you try to put one in a neophallus, you're running the risk of flap loss, first of all. But second of all, um, there's a million little nuances like how to get that proximal fixation right. How long do you make it? How do you not erode through the tip? Because there's no end of a core body. How do you get the catheter in? Do you need a catheter? How do you avoid, you know, your, the urethra is extremely colonized and how do you avoid contaminating your whole device during the procedure? So um, anyway, a talk, an hour talk for another day. Great. Um, some questions about sort of post-operative care. How soon can patients, how long do patients need to be on bed rest? How soon can they resume? sexual activity and um, sort of how long do you follow up these patients with your follow-up algorithm? So for vaginoplasty, patients stay in the hospital five days. You can send them home earlier and a lot of centers do with a sutured in packing, um, but we do five days. Patients uh, get up and walk around the next day um, and they go home post up day five. Um, what was the other just... Uh, so when can they resume sexual activity? Uh, they start dilating a few days after. That's about twice a day. For a while, at the three-month mark, they can usually back down to once a day, and um, 
and they can start having sex at the three month mark. Great. And then sort of general follow up, how long do you follow um, these patients out? They are followed intermittently every three to six months for a year and then annually in general, but some patients drop off. A uh, question about phalloplasty. You mentioned that the ALT is thicker than the ALT plus the SCIP. Uh, could you explain sort of why that is? Seems kind uh, of just the, the thickness of your skin. So if you do a skin pinch on your arm, it's always nice and thin. Even if you're a big person, um, and keep in mind, uh, these are patients on testosterone and they get thicker flaps. So if you go to a random person, even if you're your own, some patients have really thick thighs. You can't pinch it in your skin. Now you need to take a newspaper with a bunch of layers that's thick and fold it once. That's going to be double thick. But if you fold it f twice, it gets really thick. So, um, so rolling a thick flap twice makes a very, very thick penis, which I showed you in that previous slide. And so you can debulk it later, but it's a pain in patients. And then, you know, I have one patient, we didn't do it, but I'm managing his urethra now. And he has this giant ALT and he's on like his fourth urethral surgery. And so he's just unhappy and his, he and his wife are annoyed that he went for an ALT in the first place and he got a urethra. But anyway, and so one way to manage that is a groin flap and you can feel on yourself after this conference, uh, your groin, and it's very thin in almost everyone. So you end up with this thin but well vascularized urethra and that's one option. People have tried um, an ALT for the inside and a RFF for the or I'm sorry, ALT for the outside and RFF for the inside because that gives you a thin urethra and only a single roll of the ALT so you get the same benefit. But now you got put a free flap which wants to swell inside. You know, a pedicle flap tends to be a little more reliable than a free flap. So it's a little, um, so you know, there's no right answer but these are all things in your armamentarium. Great. Question about orchiectomies. Uh, is there any concern using a silk over the non absorbable suture causing additional issues such as fistulas and granulation tissue. Thoughts on using a Vicro or a ligature? Uh, uh, for your yeah, I don't think any of it's wrong. I, I think if you are gonna, I mean, people do orcs for cancer all the time and orcs for a variety of other reasons. And some people use Vicrols and some people use silks. Uh, anecdotally, I've had more patients have hematomas when I use Vicrols, so I switch back to silk and a little stronger. Um, I also am pretty aggressive on the high ligation, so they're, they're not palpable at all at the end of the case, but I mean, I guess in theory, you would be able to feel that tiny little suture there, but on the other hand, um, they're so high and you're going to have a stump anyway that I, I don't think people really notice. Great. Uh, a question about sort of preoperative requirements before these major surgeries for your vaginoplasty and neophalluses. You have A1C cutoffs, prealbumin cutoffs for these patients. I mean, you generally want to make them make sure they're healthy. The vast majority of patients are pretty young and fit, but there are older patients. We definitely make them quit smoking for all of these procedures and do do cotinine tests and do cancel surgeries. And, you know, it's hard as a, as a surgeon who's busy, who is looking at my Thursday and I get an email, you know, a week before saying they failed their cotinine test and there's no patient ready to go, ready to slide in there. So I have to sit idle, but it does matter. Um, these are elective surgeries and there's flap and wound, high wound healing problems. So definitely controlled diabetes. I don't have a fixed cutoff, but I think, you know, kind of like what the you would do for a penile prosthesis, you know, somewhere in the eights would be a good target, less than eight would be a target, but it's a personalized thing. Um, but smoking's a hard stop. People used to have BMI cutoffs. Um, it is better to do it for thin patients. Actually, anecdotally, vaginoplasty is way easier if they used to be a little bit heavier and lost some weight because their skin is very stretchy and some of our best outcomes are in those patients rather than the 110 120 pound patients who've been thin their whole life because their skin's more taut um but yeah great uh question about sort of how many of these surgeries are you guys doing at your center and also if there are frequent legal issues that come up with this type of practice uh, so I highly suggest a comprehensive center that's used to doing prior auths, used to working through logistics, used to doing um, peer to peers, et cetera, et cetera. It helps a lot that we have a care coordinator who manages the letters and stuff like that. Patients really don't get in the door unless they're ready to go. Patients don't just walk in off the street and say, hey, I want a vaginoplasty. I've never been on hormones. I never, you know, they're sort of, we have a system in place where they see hormone providers first. They basically are at or almost have their criteria met and then they sign up uh, and then they see 
the plastic surgeon and myself, and they're sort of ready to go for a prior auth, or maybe they need a tiny revision on a letter, or maybe they need a hair removal, and then they touch base with us back once they're done with that. Um, um, did that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, we'll just do one more sort of uh, a question about nomenclature. Why is gender affirming preferred over gender, gender confirmation? It's a subtle nuance that um, affirming is a little more uh, the, you're affirming what the patient already uh, knows or wants. It's a hard concept to explain. I'll probably misspeak. But uh, confirming is a little more like the surgeon is doing the act of confirming something. Does that make sense? I don't know. I'd need like a thesaurus and dictionary in front of me to get it quite right. But um, but uh, many people still use confirming, and it's totally fine. Um, some people, some people use all sorts of nomenclature, and um, I don't judge anyone for doing it. But I'm um, generally, uh, if you're going to choose one as the one that's least likely to offend people, genital uh, genital affirming surgery, gender affirming surgery. Great. Well, thank you again, Dr. Pariser, uh, for a wonderful talk. Uh, just a reminder, the video for this talk and the Q&A and the slides will all be posted on the website. Um, and then a reminder for the next talk to log out and log back in. And that one will start at uh, 10 minutes after the hour. Uh, but thank you again. And thanks everyone for tuning in. Thank you.